And if all else fails, a pair, a pair of earplugs can come in handy. That telephone number for calls on personal accident and injury insurance, 71 580 From today's team, goodbye. You and Yours was presented by Margaret Collins. Now at 25 past 12, it's time for some light-hearted political banter. Out of order, a quiz about politics. In the chair, Patrick Hannon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the show in which politicians demonstrate that just because they say hear, hear, it doesn't mean they listen. For, as John Major stated, a consensus politician is someone who does something that he doesn't believe is right because it keeps people quiet when he does it. <laughs> Two people who believe they're always right, even when their answers disprove it, are our regular team captains, Julian Critchley, the Tory member for Aldershot, and Austin Mitchell, the Labour MP for Great Grimsby. Joining them are with Julian, the Liberal Democrat MP, Alan Beath, and with Austin, the Times columnist, Matthew Paris. <laughs> You'll be glad to learn that our scoring system is still in line with the latest European guidelines. A correct answer is worth two points, a funny answer, one point, although these rates may vary to keep us within the narrow band of the uh, ERM. Our first round is an individual one based on quotations which concern political image. Julian Critchley, who here doesn't want to become an N.O.W. person? I'm not going to get into organising my life the way the papers would want me to. Otherwise, I'd spend all of it having sex with sports stars and writing about it in the news of the world. There Is we are, Julian. Mm. Who, who said didn't want to do that? What was it Colin Moynihan before he got married? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> the former miniature of a sport. Do you want to say that again, Austin? <laughs> Surely it was Dame Kenneth Berman. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're on very dangerous ground. <laughs> well, let's stay there. Well, if you will ask <laughs> a silly question. <laughs> a silly uh, uh, can we have our all purpose answer? Yes, go on, an all purpose answer. Uh, Edwina Curry. Not Edwina Curry. <laughs> <laughs> What we need is a lawyer, not a chairman. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a, a gentleman who has uh, uh, certainly been written about a lot by the papers, uh, and there's been some speculation on the way he lives, if I can put it that way. This could embrace half the Conservatives. Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the clue is it's not a member of the Conservative Party. Oh, well. And unamb unambitious, because if it were a Conservative, he would want to have sex with sports stars and write about it in the news of the world. Neil oh, I know it was. Not Neil Kinnock, no. Ron Brown. Not probably. Ron Brown. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've libeled almost everyone. Uh, it was actually said by Ken Livingstone. He said that if the papers had their way, his life would consist of nothing but a series of athletic amour and pop uh, that he would report on for the news of the world. Shortly after this statement, Mr. Livingstone began writing for The Sun although his column doesn't as yet appear in the sports pages. <laughs> Austin Mitchell, who peered owlishly over his specs to issue this warning? We have been too much like Billy Bunter. We have been happily consuming without counting the cost. We have been waiting for a postal order to turn up. Well, the, the, not the specs made me think of Geoffrey Howe. No, not, man, not unlike Geoffrey Howe. Sounds like a conservative, but a slightly disillusioned conservative. Certainly Turn. not a disillusion. Is it open yet? Oh, yes, go on. Well, Alan. Didn't Nigel Lawson say it? No, it wasn't no. Nigel Lawson. Nigel Lawson's never seen a postal order. But <laughs> 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 well, yeah, this sort of person might well uh, still be using postal orders. He may well do, send one off with his pools coupons. Why is it John That's Stokes? That's misleading. Then? John who? Sir John Stokes. No, it's not Sir John Stokes. It's somebody more famous than Sir John Stokes. Impossible. His first name is John, but he's more famous than John Stokes. <laughs> and he's called John Major. John Major. You remember him. <laughs> <laughs> is he the man that uh, Ted Turner's going to colorize? <laughs> <laughs>
It was John Major introducing new anti-pollution measures by drawing a comparison with one of his literary favourites, Billy Bunter. It's believed one of the reasons Mr Major enjoys the Bunter books is their location, Greyfriars School. <laughs> Another is that his hero's attempts to escape financial ruin with promises that the money's in the post bear a strong resemblance to the policies of Norman Lamont. <laughs> Alan Beath. Who here feels her countrymen are more galling than gallant? Life here in politics is hellish for a woman, unless she's elderly and ugly. Edith Cresson? Quite right. At last the scorers have been troubled. <laughs> France's first female prime minister, Edith Cresson, uh, complaining that Gallic political life is hellish for any woman who isn't elderly and ugly. As you'd expect, this doesn't apply in Britain, where things are arranged so that life for the Prime Minister is made hellish by ugly scenes created by a certain elderly woman. <laughs> she doesn't think, she... think that life is very nice for English men, as I recall, but that's another story. Well, that's true. She didn't think English men were very competent, but she's going to change her name to Edith Croissant until she'd be better bred then. <laughs> Is it, is it true that, that um, Cresson... If you had any points, Austin, I would deduct <laughs> it. Is it. Is it true that Cresson means watercress and coal means cabbage, and so the top man in Germany is Mr. Cabbage and in France Mrs. Watercress? I, I've heard that. I think it's true. How much better life would be here if we had some vegetables in the cabinet? <laughs> 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 That, that is one of the great jokes there. about the last we government. Have the green. Matthew Paris, who tries to chart his party's appeal here? Labour is the music of dire straits, the Tories are the music of simple minds, but we're the new kids on the block. I think that is Paddy... Oh, no, it wasn't Paddy Ashton, it was Charles Kennedy, that's right. Oh, yes, Chuck, right Chuck. At the beginning. Kennedy. Chuck, yes, Chuck. yes. <laughs> President Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the original Beastie Boy. <laughs> Alan Beath knew that immediately. It was Charles Kennedy at the 1991 Liberal Democrat Conference saying that to be reminded of Labour, you should listen to the music of Dire Straits, preferably on a record player with an auto policy changer. Uh, <coughs> He then went on to remark that the Conservatives are best evoked by simple minds, especially if the stereo sound keeps swinging to the right. Oh and that the Liberal Democrats most resembled new kids on the block, although the group has got more members. <laughs> <coughs> that brings us to the end of the round. The scores are Julian Critchley and Alan Beath 2, Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris 2. <laughs> now for an individual round in which we shovel the dust from some sound archive recordings with a Middle Eastern theme and ask for identification of the speaker and what they're talking about. Julian Critchley first. Who here prepares to rely on strong and armed tactics? And where do you have to get this strength from? Where do you have to get your arms from? First of all, from uh, in ourselves. Mm -hmm. The strength is first of all found in men. In men and women. When I say men in Israel, there's no difference between men and women. They're also in them. And then the necessary, the minimum of arms which are necessary for an, for an army to defend itself. And to be a deterrent, because we don't want to win a war. We can win a war, if there will be a war. But we don't want to have a war, we want to, to uh, prevent a war. Do you know, I mean, the, the quality of the, the recording might uh, help you there. It was quite a long time ago. You can tell by the fruity BBC voice of the interview. Well, and, and Things all Things are not the as good as that now. <laughs> It may come back. It was uh, deep enough for Gilda Meir, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it wasn't deep enough for Gilda Meir. I think you've got the wrong side, actually. I think it was... Oh, do you? Oh, Alan, oh, come on then. Tell me. us who you think it was. No, I... It, it, it it's quite a long time ago. I mean, I, well, I can tell you that that was 30, just over 30 Ooh. years ago. Wait. Anybody? No. Well, how, how about Moshe Dayan? Uh, not Moshe Dayan, Dayan, no. You were thinking it wasn't an Israeli. I mean, he was talking about Israel. Uh, NASA. <laughs> it wasn't NASA. <laughs> if, it, it wasn't if you were to pick the person, it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't NASA. <laughs> it, it couldn't have been Ben Gurion. Yes, it, yeah, it was Ben Gurion. Yes, it, it was Ben Gurion. Go on. It was Ben Gurion. You, you win on. a point. It was Ben Gurion. You, you squeeze one. 
assault people. It was Israel's Prime Minister David Ben Gurion in 1961, interviewed during a visit to Britain on how his country would defend itself against attack. Mr. Ben Gurion's assertion there that there was no difference be between men and women in Israel was greeted with some surprise by his cabinet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then ignored when they couldn't decide which minister's responsibility it was to explain the difference to him. <laughs> uh, Matthew, who here claims his forebears forbore war? The ancient Jewish people gave the world the vision of eternal peace, of universal disarmament, of abolishing the teaching and the learning of war. Do you know who that was, Matthew? He sounds too nice and civilized a man to be a politician. Well, it's only a speech. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, I, I'll, I'll try Begin, but I don't you know. You're quite right. Oh, well, uh, Menachem Begin. Uh, do you know what occasion that was? Got, got any idea? When he, when he got the, uh, the peace prize. Uh, quite right. For the, for the yes. settlement. You can certainly have two, two points for that. Menachem Begin accepting the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize and asserting that the ancient Jewish people believed in peace, disarmament, and the abolition of war, which led skeptics who'd read the Old Testament to remark that they'd managed to find no reference to any anti diluvian hippies. <laughs> Alan, who here talks about not talking? No, because we have no negotiations with the Palestinians. Uh, they have uh, nothing to offer us, we have nothing to offer to them. Except that after there is a peace agreement, any country where they will be in, let us assume Jordan, if they want our help in uh, building up the country and development of the country, we'll would be delighted to do that. I still think it's Golda Meir. <laughs> it wasn't, it was Helen Shapiro. <laughs> 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 oh, Helen Shapiro would have sang it. But, uh, that lovely deep voice it's that Golda you Mayer. admire so much. Golda Meir. In, uh, Golda Meir in 1972, indicating that Israel wasn't interested in talking to the Palestinians, but would be delighted to help them develop whichever country they wanted to settle in. But even this offer was withdrawn, however, when it became apparent <laughs> that the Palestinians had little enthusiasm for moving to Antarctica. <laughs> Can I have an extra rem remark for revealing that she was really Golda Meyerson, since you gave Austin an extra mark for some other I don't think I did give Austin point. an extra we mark. Extra mark. Mm, we need them very badly, and she was definitely called Golda Meyerson. Oh, all right, have an extra mark then. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That, but that I've got to give one to Austin as well. If, if this is going to be marked on Euro scale levels, I'm calling Leon Britton in to adjudicate on this point. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very valuable piece of information anyway, Alan, and we'll move on. And I'll, uh, Alanson, 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 actually. <laughs> <laughs> Austin Mitchell, who here indicates that there's no room for compromise? Our position is that any Arab rule in this part of our country will not be tolerated and accepted by the Israeli people. There you are, Austin? Yes, sir, that's my Arafat. No? It's <laughs> 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 not again. <laughs> I, if, you, if you can think of a song to, uh, and put this man's name into it, you'll do well. Well, I, I wouldn't take the sort of intellectual prowess, even of our leading politicians, to work out that we've had three prime ministers from one country, and it's just possible that the fourth might be from the same country, if I can put it helpfully. <laughs> You Who don't is know. the Israeli Prime Minister these days? <laughs> Are we allowed to speak? <laughs> yeah, I got, Alan, you better... Shamir. Itzhak Shamir. Have you got anything to sing about Itzhak Shamir? A way of exoneration <laughs> mitigation? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say. That was uh, Itzhak Shamir stating during the 1986 Israeli elections that his country had no room to share with the Arabs. This policy was continued in the 1991 Arab-Israeli peace talks where he didn't even feel able to share a corridor with them. That brings us to the end of the round. The scores now are Julian Critchley and Alan Beath, seven, Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris, five.
The next round gives each team the chance to work out the identity of a well-known political figure from a set of six clues. If you get the name correctly after the first clue, six points, the clues supposedly get easier as they go along and the points diminish accordingly. One guess per clue only, Julian and Alan are going to start. For six points, he got a one-year life for Easter. If you get that, you deserve mm. <laughs> 12 points. Deeply religious sounding clue, that. It is, isn't it? Mm. Still mm. hasn't helped me there. No. no. I don't think it would help anyone, to be fr quite frank. No idea. We'll go on then to five points. He got out to go home for five million dollars. Just as impenetrable, unless you happen to know. As you say, impenetrable. Uh, for guess. four points, he stopped an oath in 1932. Oath or oath? Oath. <laughs> <laughs> 1932? Mm. Not 1937, no? 1932. No, not 1937, 1932, it says here. Oh. This is, I tell you, this is astonishingly difficult. Um, <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't you give it to Austin and Matthew? Go on, then. Let's well, even when we finished, I could give it to them, and they still <laughs> wouldn't get it. Uh, for three points, he was born in New York City. That narrows it down a bit, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd be helpful. It's, it's um, someone who was prominent, uh, not a million miles from here, but um, certainly not in, in mainland Britain. All right, for two points, he declared Ireland an, an, an autonomous state. Oh, that's Eamon de Valera. Eamon de Valera is quite yeah. right. The uh, former, the late president of the Republic of Ireland. Um, he got one year life for Easter. He was sentenced to life imprisonment uh, during the Easter right. Rising. Oh, yeah. And then that was commuted to a year imprisonment. Uh, he escaped from jail, went back to the United States um, where he was born. He was born in New York City. Uh, where he collected five million dollars and he stopped the oath of allegiance uh, in 1932. There we are, two points for that then. Austin and Matthew, your clues are as follows. For six points, ten years after being found not a runner, he won. That's very cryptic as well. Not a runner. We're talking about elections, but yes, carry on. Well, we're not. He, he's the first under a woman. <laughs> I very much doubt it. <laughs> very specialist question. Uh, for four points, he was born in the north and moved south. He was, for three points, he was Minister of Justice, then Minister of Finance. You ought to get it now. Is it hockey? Let's try hockey. Charlie Hockey. Mm. Charlie Hockey. Ten years after being found not, not a, a, runner, not a course, runner, not a he was acquitted <coughs> of gun running in 1969. He became leader of uh, Fianna Fáil in 1979. First uh, Irish mm. Prime Minister to serve under a woman president. Um, and there we are, Minister of Justice, Robin. Minister of Finance. That gets you a brilliant three points. And it brings the scores to Julian Critchley and Alan Beath, 11. Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris, 11. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time for a round which features music, normally accompanied by a rush to get out of cinema exits around the world as we ask our teams to identify some national anthems. Uh, this week the tunes are not so, not so much far out as far east. Julian and Alan, which nation does this anthem have screaming for Mao? Must be China. You, you, you guessed that it wasn't the limit Liberal Democrats. <laughs> People's Republic of China. People's Republic of China. What more? What more? Whatever it's called. <laughs> but not in Chinese. You can yes. Isn't you can tell the, me that because I don't know. Isn't it called the East is Red? Oh, I expect so. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> what is that in Chinese, uh, Alan? I'll ask Paddy Ashton and come back when he oh, tells yes. me. Oh yes. 
That was the tune that has one-fifth of the world's population standing to attention and miming the words, Communist China's national anthem, adopted in 1949, and known as Quan Jin. The lyrics to the anthem were written by someone called Tian Han. So that is the Chinese name for it, Quan Jin. Hey, large oh yeah, large Jin would be more yeah, like it. Number 15 <laughs> on the menu. Uh, it was written by Tian Han, who was purged in the Cultural Revolution, which saved the Chinese government from having to pay him countless billions in royalties. <laughs> Austin and Matthew, which people does this tune make think of nipping home for a bit? It's rather moving, isn't it, for mm. a change? It's, it's a, nice, nice. a nice one. Mm. We, we assume it with such an extravagant clue that it must be uh, Japan. Yeah. We can only assume that. And the literal translation is, climb upon my knee, sonny boy. <laughs> 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 what I want you to do, Austin, for the points is to sing it. <laughs> and listen, listen, Dorma. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. The very stately Japanese national anthem is believed one of the reasons the music is so unremittingly solemn and measured is that workaholic Japanese musicians aren't prepared to take even a few bars rest. <laughs> <laughs> is, there is there a karaoke version of it? <laughs> See you in the pub later. At the end of the round, the scores are Julian Critchley and Alan B. 13, Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris 13. <laughs> Now for another team round, it's called Off the Record. I'm going to give the teams an anecdote on a particular topic, which today is verbal infelicities. They then have to delight us with an interesting story of their experience related to it. Scoring will be according to select committee rules, with extra points for delivering something unbelievable with a straight face. First, the anecdote. American journalist Molly Ivins recounts how, during the 1984 presidential election, Walter Mondale, the Democratic candidate, accused George Bush of lacking the manhood to apologize for a mistake. Bush was incensed, and at the first opportunity, declared to a press conference, on the manhood thing, I'll put mine up against Mondale's any time. <laughs> <coughs> the reporters could hardly believe their ears. <laughs> Later that day, Bush, who had avoided any further questions, turned as he entered his plane, waved to reporters and called, so long, half of them responded in chorus, How long, George? <laughs> <laughs> well, Julian, can you improve on that? Well, I don't know if my story is unhappy or happy, felicitous or unfelicitous. Um, Monsignor Ronald Knox, the famous Roman Catholic priest, as a young man used to go to... Normandy on a sort of busman's holiday where he took the services in an obscure Norman village and as in those days the services in Catholic Church were all in the vernacular there was no problem where he found it extremely difficult was when he had to listen to confession and he decided because of the thickness of the Norman accent that the only tactic he could adopt was to wait patiently and then say at intervals vous avez avez vous <laughs> 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 Austin. Well, being uh, what Dr. Spooner would have described as a shining wit, uh, my story is uh, actually about me. Uh, uh, I'd arrived. That's the only thing he knows anything about. <laughs> <laughs> Never gets in the Times, though, does it? <laughs> I, I'd arrived in New Zealand as a, as a, a pristine, bright, keen university teacher to my first job at the very Presbyterian University of Otago. Uh, and I was taking my very first class, which was History 2, uh, and talking to them, because it was uh, that stage in the course they'd reached, about uh, the Romantic movement, which I contrasted uh, with the philosophy of the, of the previous century. And 
uh, said, uh, of course, the, the big difference, difference was that the, the, the philosopher regarded the state as a kind of mechanism which you can take apart and assemble at will. Has it whereas, got much longer to go now? Uh, <laughs> 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 whereas the romantic, do I get injury time? Mm -hmm. uh, the program might. Uh, whereas the, uh, the, the romantics regarded the state as an orgasm. The way you tell us, it's the way you tell us. <laughs> well, being in New Zealand, nobody knew what it was. <laughs> how do you account, how do you account for New Zealand, <laughs> Matthew Paris? Well, I could I could tell the story about the man who, at the age of forty-five, discovered that her suit did not mean nevertheless and committed suicide, <laughs> but. Mrs. Thatcher, apparently, on visiting some site of industrial desolation in the north, uh, was uh, asked by photographers to pose standing against a slag heap, and she said, you've had me on this slag heap before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think five points to uh, either side there. Scores now are Julian Critchley and Alan Beath, 18, Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris, 18. <laughs> So, to the final round, which is, as ever, a test of both skill and memory. This week, we're going to ask our teams to tell us all they know about some scandals of the Reagan presidency, and hope they can do a bit better than Ronnie's usual response of, I don't recall. The object of this round is to answer as many of <coughs> 15 questions as possible in two minutes. First person to hit their bell or buzzer and supply the correct answer gets the point. If they're wrong, it's open to the other team, and it begins now. Scandals came early to Reagan's presidency. What item of his opponents did he acquire before he was even elected? Yes, Austin. Ah, it was the speech that uh, Carter was going to make. Well, that's, that's close. Uh, a, a notebook containing Carter's debating strategy. Yes. Uh, point for you. After the election, Carter accused Reagan of filling his cabinet with members of which minority group? Yes, Austin again. Harvard. No, oil millionaires. Oh. Uh, <laughs> in 1983, William Casey, the director of the CIA, was investigated. What for? Not a sound. Insider trading. Who was the attorney general investigated for allegedly helping a friend gain a $32 million army contract? Yes, Austin. Ed Meese. Ed Meese, Edwin Meese III. Who was Reagan's Supreme Court nomination that the Senate rejected in 1987? Yes, I'll, I'll, uh, Matthew. I'll try King again. No, it was Robert H. Bork. Bork, that's right. The Bork. That's Reagan's right. substitute nomination did no better. Who was he? Nothing doing. Douglas Ginsburg. Why did he have to abandon the nomination? Well, if you don't know him, he admitted that he smoked marijuana while a teacher at Harvard Law School. Which campaign of Nancy Reagan's did this clash with? Remember her campaign? Drugs? Yes. A, a campaign against drugs? Campaign against drugs, Austin. Yes, don't be shy. <laughs> the Just Say No Anti-Drugs campaign. What had it been revealed four years earlier that Nancy had trouble saying no to? <laughs> yes. Uh, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> 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 Point for you, Julian, although that is not the answer. And it's all lies. It was dresses. Dresses is right point for you as well, Austin. Gifts of expensive designer clothes. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, the round, the end of the contest indeed. And the final scores are uh, Julian Critchley and Alan Beath, 19, but Austin Mitchell and Matthew Paris, 22. <laughs> And as our surprised winners produce notes for a one-hour victory speech, all that remains is to thank Julian Critchley, Austin Mitchell, Alan Beath and Matthew Paris, and to leave you with this quote from Henry Kissinger, which may explain why politicians are always doing what they do to the country. Power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Out of Order was presented by Patrick Hannon with readings by Peter Donaldson. The series is written and compiled by Michael Dines and produced by Diane Messiahs.
And Austin and Julian's guests next week will be MP Sir David Steele and journalist Michael White. How far will the BBC go to bring you the news? This is the highway to Basra, Iraq's second city. Headed north on foot, six weary Sudanese men wearing sandals and carrying... The vicinity of Mount Pinatubo, skies obscured by dark clouds, raining ash and rock as lava flows continue from the volcano's two craters. The American evacuation follows the... As we sailed in the dark past coastal villages in Montenegro, the refugees saw their first electric light in five weeks. One little girl pointed at the coast and screamed at her mother that all the houses were on fire. With over 150 correspondents worldwide, we'll go to the ends of the earth. The BBC, on television and on radio, news coverage at its best. This is Radio 4. In a couple of minutes, a look ahead to the afternoon on 4. First, with the time at 5 to 1, a look at the weather with Ian McCaskill. Good afternoon. As we go towards the weekend, our forecast charts show us a changeable but often mild scenario. All of us will see a little spring-like sunshine over the next few days, but there will be spells of wind and rain as well. The heaviest rain and the strongest winds over Scotland and Northern Ireland. On a more positive note, I should add that we don't expect much in the way of frost or fog over the next few days. Many places are bright and breezy at the moment, but a deep low is developing in mid-Atlantic and that'll spread high winds and rain to Scotland and Northern Ireland overnight and to Wales, Northern and Western England during tomorrow. For the forecast for today and tonight, I'll follow this division of the country and I'll start with the Midlands, East Anglia, Central Southern England and South East England, including the London area. A few spots of rain in places, but on the whole, dry today with broken cloud, a little sun and a light of moderate southwesterly breeze. Mild too with temperatures around 11 degrees Celsius. Tonight, mainly dry with lowest temperatures around 7 degrees Celsius and later freshening southerly winds. Moving north and west now to Wales, southwest England and all of northern England. A little rain and drizzle in the southwest, but dry and mild in most places today and bright over much of northern England. Temperatures around 10 or 11 degrees Celsius with moderating southwesterly breezes. Tonight, some drizzle in the south and west, but mostly dry with temperatures no lower than 5 degrees Celsius but winds strengthening from the south later and reaching gale force and exposed western headlands before morning. Finally, Scotland and Northern Ireland. At first today, a breezy mixture of sun and showers. Some of the showers heavy with hail and thunder in parts of the north. Fresh and strong southwesterly winds decreasing as we go through the afternoon and temperatures in the afternoon around 8 degrees Celsius everywhere. Showers dying away by evening, but thickening cloud and strengthening southerly winds will carry rain to parts of Northern Ireland and Western Scotland in the first part of the night. Heavy in places later, 